just uh, heard an excellent uh, ITC colloquium by Jenny Green, who is sitting back there and used to be a, a graduate student in our department, and we remember her very fondly, and she by now uh, matured to become a leading uh, observer with very exciting uh, results that she reported about. And she will talk also at this lunch uh, about something else. Um, we'll start with uh, Sonak Bose, uh, our own. Uh, we'll talk about how the present day distribution of dwarf galaxies encodes the physics of realization. And he spells realization with an S rather than a Z because he is from Britain. Because <laughs> I was taught correctly, that's what <laughs> Right. Uh, and uh, then we hear from Jenny, and she will talk about the recently quenched massive galaxies at redshift 0.7 with lots of molecular gas. Uh, and after that, we'll hear from Adam Frank, who is the CFA colloquium speaker. I'm not sure if he, he arrived as of yet, but he's, he's in Uber right now. Uh, in Uber. <laughs> How far is the Uber? <laughs> Somewhere between Logan and, and here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so he will definitely make it, uh, but by the time we get to him. And hopefully he will talk about 3D AMR simulations of common end of evolution. What about accretion? And finally, we'll hear from our own uh, Peter Williams. Uh, we'll talk about Jovian <coughs> spheres beyond the solar system. So, uh, right, so what I wanted to talk about today was a project that I just very recently completed with uh, Alice Deason and Carlos Frank in Durham. Um, and when it comes to, you know, connecting dwarf galaxies and reionization, it would really pain me to start anywhere else uh, apart from, uh, oh God, it's stuck. Okay, apart from here, uh, which is the so-called missing satellites problem, which we heard about uh, in the colloquium just earlier. So the missing satellites problem, which was posed at the sort of turn of the 20th century, 1999, um, uh, can be sort of summarized in these two pictures where on the left you see the uh, number of satellites that have been observed around the Milky Way by Sloan and the Dark Energy Survey, um, around 54 satellites have been found. And on the right is a projection of the prediction from cold dark matter for the abundance of dark matter subhalos around the Milky Way-like host, where you see hundreds and thousands of these potential hosts for uh, small galaxies, which vastly outnumber the number of actual observed satellites. And this has been ascribed as a, you know, problem for the cold dark matter model. And the question is, if CDM is the right theory, why do most subhalos remain dark? And the answer to this has actually been known for quite a while now. And it's simply that, you know, for the small galaxies or the small halos, when you actually compare apples with apples and you actually include the in incorporated effects of supernova feedback, which blows out gas and inhibits star formation, and the effect of reionization, which heats up gas to above the virile temperature, preventing the gas from cooling into small halos, you actually suppress the formation of low-mass galaxies. And in fact, this is something, for example, you see an image here from the Apostle simulations of the local group, the vast difference between the number of observed galaxies uh, versus the actual dark matter abundance. And this is something that's been known for quite a while, um, you know, dating back to the late 80s and early 90s, um, so, so in some ways, the missing satellites is a curious problem because it's something to which the solution has actually been known longer than the problem itself has been around. But when it comes to reionization, there are a few key questions that one could ask, you know, such as when does reionization take place? And, uh, you know, with the link to dwarf galaxies, what are the halos that are actually affected by it? You know, where the heating of gas will actually prevent the cooling of gas in these halos. And there are some associated questions associated with those. What I like about these questions is that they not only are intimately related to the details of galaxy formation, but at some level also to the nature of dark matter. Um, but for the purpose of this talk, I will only focus on cold dark matter, and specifically the first few questions. And what I'll try to uh, sort of demonstrate is that perhaps clues to these two questions uh, can actually be seen or be read off from the distribution of dwarf galaxies at the present day, specifically by looking at the shape of the luminosity function rather than the cumulative number counts of satellites, which is what's more commonly done. So to answer this, uh, I make use of a large uh, cosmological dark matter-only simulation called the Copernicus Complexio Simulations. Um, and so there's more than 13 billion particles in here with a pretty good uh, mass resolution of around 10 to the 5 solar masses. Uh, 
And from that, you can extract you know, samples of Milky Way-like and LMC-like hosts, as determined by the halo mass. And to learn something about galaxy formation, basically we use a semi-analytic model of galaxy formation called GALFORM, which has been developed in Durham for the past three decades or so. And essentially what GALFORM does is it takes these merger trees and then you know, incorporates some models for the gas and dust and has differential equations that you know, determine the cooling of gas, star formation, feedback, and so on. And you essentially get a series of numbers which reflect the galaxy properties associated with the galaxy formation model and that particular merger tree. And there's always a question of the free parameters of these models, and essentially we calibrate them to reproduce some small set of present-day observable properties of the field galaxies. So since reionization is the focus of uh, what I want to talk about, let me tell you how we actually model it. So essentially to mimic the effect of you know, gas being inhibited, or the cooling of gas being inhibited in low-mass halos, we use this two-parameter approach, where we basically say that we will turn off cooling of gas in a halo with a circular velocity VC, if this circular velocity is less than a threshold value V cut at redshift Z less than Z cut. Okay, so in this parameterization, V cut is basically a parameter that controls the characteristic scale where the F below which the effect of reionization is to basically prevent the cooling of gas in halos smaller than that. And fiducially, we choose a value that corresponds to about 30 kilometers per second, which is a number that you can actually calibrate according to hydrodynamical simulations. And it has a sort of very rich history behind it. Alternatively, Z-cut is a parameter which controls when reionization happens, uh, and fiducially, we choose a value of redshift 10. And while it may appear as a you know, rather oversimplified approach at first with just two parameters, it actually turns out to be a very good approximation to much more detailed and self-consistent calculation of the whole reionization process as many semi-analytical uh, groups have uh, you know, done in the past, uh, as listed there. So what I will show now is essentially a cartoon summary of the various numerical experiments that we conducted in actually varying these values of Z-cut and V-cut, or essentially these two questions pertaining to reionization, and how the luminosity function of satellites of the Milky Way actually responds to changes in these parameters. So what I'm showing here on the x-axis is the uh, V-band magnitude of satellites of the Milky Way and the number of satellites in a given, of a given magnitude on the y-axis. So the gray curve is our fiducial model, and the blue and orange curves are basically responses to changes in Z-cut or when reionization happens. And what we'll see is characteristic about all these curves is that it's not just a simple power law, but actually there are two bumps in here, right, which are segregated by some characteristic valley, which I'll explain to you in a second. But essentially the behaviors that we find is that if you change the redshift of reionization, pretty much nothing happens to the bright galaxies above some particular scale determined by the location of this valley. But the abundance of satellites at the very faint end are very sensitively dependent on exactly when reionization is happening. So if you delay reionization, you get the blue curve, and essentially you have much longer for halos to continue building stars before you know, their cooling is turned off. So you build up that end. And alternatively, if reionization happens very early on, then you don't have enough time, and essentially the faint end gets suppressed by quite a lot. And to understand why this behavior actually happens, you can basically just think about how hierarchical structure formation proceeds, where what I'm showing now is the stellar mass of satellites at present day um, and the fraction of that mass that was accumulated prior to redshift 6, or whatever redshift you choose. And essentially you find that for the brightest satellites, above say 10 to the 6, pretty much none of the mass has been accumulated at the very early times, but the faint satellites have accumulated the vast majority of their mass by this time, which is why it's only the faint end that responds and not the bright end. So what actually determines this transition between the faint and the bright or the pre- and post reionization populations? And that actually turns out to be the effect of V-cut or the characteristic overdensities affected by reionization. And so again, the gray curve shows the fiducial 30 kilometers per second value. And if you increase that to, say, 50 kilometers per second, you see that this valley recedes to much larger values meaning that now you actually suppress cooling in much larger halos, preventing the formation of bright satellites. And you immediately know that cannot be made too large because, for example, for the Milky Way, we know how many bright satellites there are, brighter than, say, minus 8.8 .8 or so. And conversely, if the circular velocity is pushed much lower than 30 kilometers per second, now you allow much smaller halos to continue forming stars when reionization kicks in, and essentially this valley shifts to much fainter magnitudes. <coughs> 
So the picture that we come up with is essentially there's this bimodality in the luminosity function of satellites, and essentially this transition between a pre- and post ionization population can be read off uh, by essentially looking at where this dip or this valley occurs, and the redshift of ionization actually controls the abundance of satellites fainter for the pre ionization population. So the question we ask is, okay, this is all well and good theoretically, but is there any evidence of this in the actual data? So what we sought to do was to essentially look at the luminosity function of satellites for the Milky Way, uh, which uh, Oliver Newton, who was a graduate student at Durham, basically used a sort of Bayesian inference technique to estimate what the total population brighter than uh, V by magnitude of zero should be. And we combined that with uh, satellites from pandas uh, for, for Andromeda, and essentially combined them by you know, doing various ratios for the masses between the two halos, um, assuming some radial profile, extrapolating it, and so on and so forth. And we basically asked the question, does the data actually show any evidence of bimodality as our models should predict reionization should actually bring about? And specifically, is there any evidence that a bimodal distribution is more preferred to, say, just a simple power law-like distribution? And to cut a long story short, essentially what we uh, found is that for pretty much all choices of the mass of the Milky Way and the ratio of the mass of M31 to the Milky Way, um, we basically found that the data, which is shown in the uh, black um, error bar, uh, black points, uh, always seems to prefer a double population over a single power law, um, as determined by a sort of information criterion test that we did, uh, which actually penalizes you, for, penalizes you for having more parameters and so on. Uh, so there is some tentative evidence of two populations, just a minute more, uh, in, the, in the actual data that exists at the moment, but perhaps more data is actually needed to confirm or exclude this definitively. There we go. So <laughs> um, and, and so in the, in the paper, we actually then found that the actual predictions of Galform do very well in actually uh, you know, predicting the right shape and abundance of satellites as the data predicts. Uh, as data shows, and we find a preference for halo masses of less than <coughs> 2 times 10 to the 12. We also looked at the population of satellites for LMC-like systems for our best uh, galaxy formation model, best guess for the halo mass, and we found some certain number of satellites, which is interesting. Um, if you want to read further, it's, it's uh, quite an exhilarating read. It's up, it's up there. Uh, but anyway, these are the conclusions. So reionization is, uh, is, is an interesting topic. Uh, dwarf galaxies are particularly sensitive to it, and uh, I've tried to show that maybe the shape of these luminosity functions can actually tell you quite a lot about reionization, and specifically that there seems to be some evidence that there is a pre- and post-reionization population of satellites predicted by theory, which can actually be seen in the data. And future surveys will hopefully help us understand this stuff better. Thank you very much. In the region that is over dense relative to the rest of the universe, such as the region that is made the Milky Way, the clock, the cosmological clock, is ticking faster. It's as if this part, this is part of the closed universe that is mm -hmm. behaving faster than, than our average universe. And so, um, when you infer the redshift of realization, do you need to take account of the fact that you're looking at dwarf galaxies in an over dense region in the sense that the redshift that you will infer for realization was earlier? So, this region was ionized before the rest of the universe. Was. Right. So, so what, what's quite interesting, I find, about this whole uh, V cut, Z cut stuff that I was talking about was there was a, a, a paper by um, uh, Andrea Font in 2011 who actually used the Galform model to find if you actually were to account for local ionizing sources, right, where you account for the fact that you know, some places have more clustered ionizing sources than other places, than voids, for example, the luminosity function you actually infer out of that is still matched very well by this V-cut, Z-cut approach. And, um, and so, so that, that's one, one thing. The other question you could ask is about this time, fr this time window for reionization, because here the way we model it kind of just says that it Renaissance doesn't happen, and it happens, kind of thing. Um, where, where in, whereas, in fact, there is actually some spread in this relation. But I didn't, I didn't actually get the time to show this, but actually what our, our results show is that um, you can change the redshift of realization by you know, maybe a delta Z of 6 or something. But what that actually translates to in terms of what you know, stellar mass does a V-cut of 30 kilometers per second correspond to doesn't actually change that much, because it's not actually that much cosmic time.
Uh, and so these, these different sort of, uh, you know, uncertainties are actually not too sensitive to actually changing the uh, qualitative predictions that these models make. Questions? It looks like everything was clear. You explained things very well. It's either, if there are no questions, it's either a compliment or an insult, but in this case, I think it's... Well, I will. Well, well. <laughs> I was just wondering about the statistical significance of your distinguishing uh -huh. between a double hump, which has more free parameters yeah. than a power law, whether there was anything there uh, that made, the, made it statistically more significant yeah. So, 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 the, so the test that we did was this uh, a Kai K information criterion test, which basically, um, you know, not only finds you the model which uh, you know gives you the best sort of fit in a chi squared sense, but it will penalize you if you have more free parameters, essentially. Um, so this, so how we sort of mimicked these two populations in the distribution was essentially to say, okay, let's mimic two populations with the sum of two Gaussians, right? So there's, I don't know, something like six parameters there relative to a Paolo, which has two. So you'll, you'll, you may have noticed that in this figure that I showed, okay, it's gone. Okay, anyway. Oh, there we go. Yeah, so in, in this figure, there were two versions of this double Gaussian that I showed. Um, the first one, which is the pink, um, is, uh, oh, magenta, whatever it is, is, uh, is basically one where there are six free parameters in it. So you can see that, you know, for example, in this AIC test, the value with the lowest AIC is basically the, the preferred model, right? Um, at, at, by some sort of criterion. And so because the pink model has six parameters compared to the yellow model, which is two, the, the model gets penalized by quite a lot and it isn't a preferred model for that particular ratio. But what we then said was that actually we don't have six free parameters because this choice of 30 kilometers per second, which is motivated by physical arguments, actually sets what the turning points in this distribution should be because it's a physically motivated. It's not just some random model that we've come out of. So what that does is it reduces your degrees of freedom from six to four, and that actually improves the level to which this uh, detection significance is found. Uh, and that is also sensitive to what choices you have for the ratio of M31 to Milky Way. And so if you choose something which is probably unrealistic, that M31 is half as massive as the Milky Way, you find that you, know, you can't really distinguish between the two models. Uh, but then if you go to, say, 1 times or 1.5 times or 2 times, um, which is probably more realistic, you find that the detection significance becomes much, much more preferred in favor of these two populations. If any of you ever uh, spend any time at galaxy evolution meetings, you could hear 20 talks in a row about quenching. What do people mean by quenching? Well, am I mic'd at all? I assume you can hear me in the back, right? Okay. Yes. Hubble, Hubble figured out that locally there are two kinds of galaxies, the red ones that are uh, supported by random motions and the blue ones that are gassy forming stars and are uh, predominantly supported by rotation and we've spent the last hundred years trying to figure out what is the process that makes massive ellipticals form what keeps them from forming stars because they really are predominantly old and red today so this is a project that's trying to understand that process as it's happening and the way we've attempted to do this, this is a, a collaboration with Mariska Creek at Berkeley and Rachel Bazanson at UPIT. And what we've done is we've selected very massive galaxies where we think most of their stars were put in place recently. So these are post-starburst galaxies. On the left, you're looking at their spectra. They are totally 100% A star dominated. So that is telling us that there was a recent star formation episode and that it has since stopped. We see no emission lines. And so as far as we can tell from the optical data, at least, they are no longer forming stars. 
On the right, this is the star formation rate versus stellar mass plot you see all the time. That blue line is the star formation main sequence. So that's the relationship between stellar mass uh, and star formation rate for typical Milky Way-like star forming galaxies uh, at, at redshift one, I think, in this case. So all of these post starbursts that we're finding are quite massive and have very low star formation rates uh, compared to blue things at, at the same epoch. Okay, so that's how they were selected. And the question is, well, first of all, they're very rare. There are 300 or so of these in all of Sloan. Rachel and Mariska typically work at redshift two when most stars were formed. We wanted to go to slightly lower redshift, a redshift where we could still find very massive galaxies, but we would be able to spatially resolve the galaxies and look at the kinematics of the stars and see if that leaves any imprint for the physical processes that stopped star formation in these galaxies. So that was the premise of the project. And then we thought, oh, wouldn't it be cool to see if they still have any molecular gas? Because if they're not forming stars anymore, you would think they would have found a way to get rid of all their gas. So those were our sort of two goals. Please does fall asleep quite quickly. And we actually were much more successful at interestingly, at getting Alma time than we were at getting Gemini time. So our first published paper shows that for the first two galaxies that we looked at with Alma, they actually have remarkably high gas fractions, uh, similar gas fractions to star forming galaxies. 30% uh, of their baryonic mass appears to be in, this, in molecular gas. And so somehow, we need to shut off the star formation in these galaxies, but still maintain a large pool of molecular gas. So that was our first kind of fun result. And we have, the reason I'm talking about this today is that we have ALMA data now coming in, 22 hours, I think, 10-ish uh, objects, more objects in our sample uh, to look at the distribution of, of gas in these galaxies. In the meantime, we are also getting information on the stellar kinematics. This is our sort of poster child guy. This is our first IFU, stellar IFU cube here on the left. This is Kiana Hunt. This is her work. Uh, she's on her way to graduate school either at Yale or Michigan. She hasn't decided yet. But we see a nice clear rotation curve in the stars, which seems to align pretty well with what we see uh, in the CO2 to 1 velocities uh, in the gas. This is the beam of the ALMA data, so we're, we're not really very well resolving it. But this seems to suggest that, for instance, this molecular gas is not in a massive outflow. It seems that the gas and stars are rotating uh, in a similar orientation. Uh, and so we think this is a relatively rotation-dominated massive galaxy. So that's just one more piece of information in terms of exactly the path to quenching that these galaxies took. And then the really kind of super cool thing that uh, Justin Spilker, who's been doing our gas analysis, sent around the other day. So this is the third object in our sample that we have a detection for. And the galaxy itself is in the center of the cube. And then we see this very kinematically cold, very luminous CO2 to 1 clump at 25 kiloparsecs from the primary galaxy. And this is the spectrum for this guy. So again, A star dominated. But you can see these two little blips here. That's the oxygen 35007 pair of lines. And if you stare at a lot of Sloan spectra, you can see that these are quite broad. So this is most likely uh, an AGN powering those emission lines. And so maybe in this source, we are seeing an outflow. We don't know. Uh, but the, the plot thickens because the next three galaxies that Justin reduced, I got this in an email last night, are non-detections. So now we have three quite gas-rich guys and three non-detections. Uh, so it'll be, it'll be fun to, to pursue. In the meantime, we're getting, with our Hyper Supreme camera data, we're getting high-resolution imaging for some of these. Uh, this is work done by Khalil Hal Hooper who's a student with me at Princeton. And you can see lots of really cool uh, morphologies here. So it, it does look like merging is going to be a significant part of the story. We see uh, evidence for disturbance in nearly all the galaxies that Khalil has looked at so far. Um, so that's, that's the story. The, 
The big question is, how do you shut off star formation in these galaxies and keep them gas rich? An obvious uh, possibility, I mean, since uh, AGNs or quasars live for tens of millions of years, uh, if you just witness the phase immediately after, would it be that uh, there was a quasar beforehand, or is that, would you see any evidence for that? Well, so that would be okay, but, but what we're trying to argue from the rotation curves is that the gas is not in an outflow. So if you want to invoke the AGN to shut off the star formation, that's fine, but it needs to do it while maintaining the molecular gas. So by stirring it somehow so that it, you know, changing the gene's length or something, but you, the gas is still there is the point. Cold. While it's molecular gas, so it's relatively cold. Thanks. Uh, do you have the resolution with Palma to really see if the dust is in the center, central few kiloparsecs of the galaxies that you're looking at? We, we uh, are proposing to Alma in a couple of weeks for higher resolution, but you can see the beam. You know, it's a couple arc seconds that we have now. We just wanted to see if they had molecular gas at all. There's an interesting, well, one of our motivations is that there are, there's a sample of post starburst galaxies at redshift zero that uh, Anne Zabludoff and, and Decker French have been looking at that are also quite molecular gas rich. Those are kind of different galaxies. The, the post-starburstness of them is that they've had recent star formation, but not sort of dominating the mass the way that ours are. So people call them K plus A galaxies. So it's not clear if those two populations are related in any way, but that, that's another interesting connection. So the, the first moment map tells you the velocities, but not where the gas is. I'm just wondering by analogy with our galaxy, where there's very dense gas in the center and a very low star formation rate, where is the gas in these galaxies? So we haven't thought deeply about that, but our spatial resolution is such that we're not resolving the galaxy r really. The fact that we see a rotation curve means that we're marginally resolving it. So I think it's probably a bit more compact than the stars, but it can't be, you know, a tenth of a parsec. Then I don't think we'd see the rotation anymore. So that's my guess. Also, the, ro the amplitude of rotation is a little bit lower in the gas than in the stars. So probably truncated compared to the stars. But again, I think we're just going to get a higher resolution map when we can and then really answer that question. rates and have calculated depletion times for the gas? So we have limits on the star formation rates, which are what I showed in that first slide. Okay, so kind of a solar mass a year is the limit, and that comes from O2. So obviously, one way we could be very fooled is if there's a bunch of dust and there's star formation that's not coming out in the optical. We're working on both getting radio continuum and getting H alpha to, to answer that. But I think the, the sense of your question is, could it just be the case that we're catching the very tail end and it's going to use up this last bit of, of gas? I actually think that's a plausible explanation and perhaps supported by the fact that we're detecting half of them and not the other half. And so you're just sort of stochastically finding things as they're shutting off and some have a little bit of gas left and some don't. Have you thought about obtaining magnetic field strength data toward these objects? In our own galaxy, we see ample evidence of magnetic fields that channel gas into filaments where stars actually form. Is it going to be coherent on galaxy-wide scale? Well, I mean, this is the question, is whether you can get the, the resolution, but at, at, at a zeroth order, it might be interesting to see. So I know people do this with mega masers. I just don't know how we would do that for these systems. So, so even with Alma, you lack the spatial resolution. Uh, certainly, with, yeah, I think so. I mean, I would think it would be totally incoherent on the scales that we can probe. And even if you, well, yeah, that, I won't say anything else intelligent, so I'll shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments? Yes, please. So in the optical IFU spectra, do you have, do you see gradients in the stellar population? 
Yeah, so that was actually one of the big selling points of the proposal, and we do have an equivalent width map, but uh, it's so noisy in the outer parts that the statement that we make in the paper is it's flat within the inner 0.6 arc seconds, and our beam is a little smaller than that. So we don't see gradients, but we're getting right into where sky subtraction gets super scary, so we don't have a strong constraint on that. <coughs> Jenny, did anyone look in numerical simulation sets just you know, freeze them and see if their galaxy is just like that, and what the fuck is the reason? I was, I was at a CCA meeting, and, and uh, the theorists made a similar suggestion, that maybe you're just catching, you know, if the depletion times are really short, you're just catching them while they're just using up the last bit of their molecular gas. But I don't think our observations have taken off en enough yet that any theorists have tried to reproduce well, Usually theories should proceed. <laughs> well, good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's thank uh, Jenny again. Our next uh, speaker just arrived uh, with an Uber. Uh, you can have your sandwich afterwards. Uh, yes, that's good. I'll try to keep you on <laughs> that wouldn't work very well. As many of you may know, uh, Adam is also contributing to NPR. He has a blog there and uh, uh, writes extremely well. And I highly recommend reading his uh, uh, blog uh, essays. Yeah, National Public Radio has a blog. And Adam writes on us. Okay, let me just make sure this is all working. Uh, we don't quite have. There we go. Okay, well, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today. Uh, obviously, later on, I'm going to be uh, talking to you about aliens, so it's nice to actually you know, have a, something a little more grounded here. Um, so what I'm going to tell you about is accretion and common envelope evolution. So my group at the University of Rochester, we both um, develop and apply advanced numerical methods, particularly adaptive mesh refinement MHD codes. So um, we have a code that we've built called AstroBear that we've been you know, developing for the last 15 years or so. Um, so this problem of common envelope evolution, you know, we're coming to it actually from the problem of planetary nebula, which has been a long-standing interest of mine. Um, and you know, planetary nebula are beautiful; they're they're you know interesting in that way. But I also want to point out, you know, some people may think like, well, these are not the cutting edge of astrophysics, but they have always served as laboratories for interesting things in astronomy. So you know, forbidden lines, you can go all the way back, and that was the first place really where people were coming to understand forbidden lines. Nebular shaping, a lot of what we know about how um, gas interacting, or nebula, uh, this is particularly true for young stellar objects, of you know, jets and flows interacting with circumstellar material came originally from uh, planetary nebula. And we've always known, or we've always thought, you know, uh, Mario Olivio and Noam Soker going way back, have always said that the bipolar shapes that we often see in planetary nebula are likely due to binary interaction. And in particular, they're likely due, at least some set of them, for common envelope evolution. Um, and so, you know, we believe we need to understand common envelope uh, uh, evolution to understand planetary nebula. But as we all know now, there's another class of objects that we really want to understand, which is the gravity wave sources or the gravitational wave sources. Um, so, you know, this remarkable discovery over the last few years of both binary uh, merging black holes and binary merging uh, neutron stars, those systems, you know, there may be other ways to do it, but most, if not all, have gone through a common envelope evolutionary uh, uh, process. So um, this is a really remarkable piece of astrophysics, which has gotten very little attention because it just is so hard to do. So I, I like to call it the grand challenge, the un, untapped grand challenge problem. So people have done, you know, the grand challenge of supernova remnants and the grand challenge of star formation. But common envelope has been sitting there as a problem we really don't understand very well. And it's only recently now, in the last few years, that you're really seeing numerics be able to uh, uh, attack it. So what is common envelope? Um, it's basically when you have two stars uh, merge to the point where the smaller star is inside the envelope of the larger one. So usually it's a giant star that overflows its Roche lobe. 
Um, the companion can't accrete fast enough, so it overflows its Roche lobe, and basically you end up with a common envelope. Then drag forces inside the envelope are strong enough to, to um, lead to very, very rapid orbital decay on the order of you know, a couple months or so. You should be able to drag the secondary all the way down to um, size scales that are comparable to the things that are going to lead to gravitational wave mergers. Um, at least that's the idea. Uh, and so then, and at the same time, we also expect that there will be a, a, a conversion of gravitational uh, energy into thermal energy from the drag, which will expel most of the envelope. So this is, we actually think this is the way, this is the seed for which a lot of the bipolar outflows we see, both in uh, planetary nebula, but also massive stars. This may be where it comes from. You eject a, the envelope, in, and it, it's a toroidal distribution, and then, you know, the, what, whatever remains drives a quasi-spherical wind, and then you end up with those beautiful bipolar lobes. Um, so, you know, it's, it is a process uh, that we think is very important for understanding, you know, this new frontier in uh, uh, astrophysics. Um, but modeling it is extremely difficult, has proven to be really, uh, has thwarted most numericists for a long time. There was only, if you go back to like before 2008, there is really literally a handful of simulations going all the way back to um, when it was first proposed in 1976. And part of the problem is you need to take a giant star and put it on your numerical grid um, and then move it around and actually shake it because you're going to have a secondary dive into it. Um, and just getting a, you know, much like the difficulty in numerical relativity was just trying to get a black hole to move across the grid without the whole thing turning into spaghetti. Um, trying to get this big extended envelope uh, with a little nugget of, of uh, you know, the core inside on the grid and behaving correctly. Not, you, know, you, turn, you put it on there, you turn it on, and the whole thing just blows up or it just collapses on itself. Trying to figure out how to get past that problem is really what took a, a long time. And you can see this, actually, so this is a MESA profile for an AGB star. Uh, actually, I think it's an RGB star. And if you look at the pressure scale heights, what you'll see there's two places where the pressure scale height becomes very small. Um, here is near the uh, transition to the, uh, the core, and then here also on the, at the envelope, or at the, the boundary between the star and the ambient medium. And so you, that means that you need very, very high numerical resolution to be able to capture the physics going on there. And if you don't, you'll just get things completely wrong. So it's figuring out ways of doing this um, that took so, so long. Um, I won't really go if we, uh, later on, if somebody's interested, just to try and keep this under 10 minutes. Um, I can tell you what we did in order to get this to work. Um, but uh, let me go on to the simulation. So this is, we're now, took us a year to actually get it to work, but now with our AMR MHD code, we can get this working, and this is the result. So this is a um, one solar mass uh, AGB, or red giant star, excuse me, with a 0.5 solar mass companion. And you can see it dives in, uh, the, um, uh, the orbit reduces considerably, and then you end up with this fairly stable, stably orbiting pair uh, driving um, spiral waves, drive, continually driving waves into the ambient medium. And you can also see, well, let's watch this again. So here you see the orbital, orbit initially decaying, material's been ejected outward, um, and then as they draw closer together, you, you know, we're using, you can see actually the effects of the AMR in this, right? You can see where you're de-refining and refining. Obviously, we're putting all the interest is down by the base there. So all the resolution is here. Uh, and that's where you'll see some, sometimes you'll see these beautiful uh, Calvin Helmholtz rolls forming. But out here, you can see that the resolution is much lower. So, you know, this is something we, we need to think about how, uh, very carefully, how the resolution plays into what we're seeing. Um, in particular, okay, so... That's what it looks like. So that's really very exciting just to be able to do that, right? That's a year's worth of work of tuning the code to be able to do that. Um, but the interesting thing is uh, the results that you get. So here is a plot of, uh, these are for two models. What you want to look at, this is radius versus time or orbital separation versus time. Um, and what you see is after about 10 days, you start at a, a 50 solar radii and you come down to about 10 solar radii. That's the big decay of the orbit, the rapid decay of the orbit, and then you end up in these things that's slowly settling into, uh, you know, uh, um, an elliptical orbit. Um, and these, there's two models here. The solid blue line is, because this is what I'm going to be talking about, the solid blue line is a model that does not have accretion. Basically, material, and we're, I'm, I'm particularly we're focused on the secondary, because that's what we're interested in. Does the secondary de accrete material as it's passing through, perhaps form an accretion disk, and then blow a jet, right? Um, so we're very interested in accretion. So we've done models where we either uh, have a subgrid model for accretion in the code, which in our case is uh, something that Krumholtz developed, 
Um, or we don't put any accretion at all. We just allow material to sort of fall onto the, what's called the sink particle, which is representing the secondary, and just sort of you know, uh, uh, fill that space up. So but what you see here is essentially is this rapid dive inward, and then this settling in to um, a, uh, a stable orbit around 10 uh, uh, um, solar radii. This is completely wrong. We need, we need this thing to dive in way, way deeper than this. And the remarkable thing about this is everybody has the same problem. Whether you're doing SPH codes, whether you're doing moving mesh, this problem of not being able to get the secondary or get the, the binary close enough to anything that you would eventually, uh, would eventually become a, um, a, a gravitational wave merger um, is really, so it's amazing, right? So it took us 30 years to be able to do this problem, and now that we do it, we're like, oh, something, something is very wrong. And so, that, which is really interesting, right? That's what makes the problem uh, interesting. So, you know, there's, what, what are your, what, what else could be happening in these simulations that we're not capturing that might allow them to get closer? It's not only just allowing the binary to get closer, we also need to drive, you know, a significant amount of mass off of the, uh, out of the envelope, and you see, you don't do that uh, either. You only get, you know, maybe maybe ten percent of the mass being unbound by this interaction. Uh, just to confirm, you know, this is this plot down here is simulations, which I consider to be very beautiful by Ullman et al., uh, where he was using a, a repo, a moving mesh code, and you know, pretty much we're almost identical. Um, we've done runs that go further out, so we can confirm these. So in general, you know, we're getting the same wrong answer that everybody else gets. So I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> um, so, but what we're interested in particular, so now that we have the code working, you know, what are we going to do with it? The first thing we want to look at is this possibility that your the secondary is accreting. Because if you can get accretion as you're driving through the uh, envelope, um, then you will most likely get jets, right? Accretion and jets often go together. And if you get jets, then the jets could be very effective at coupling, you know, at, at driving the uh, material uh, off of the envelope, right? You could sort of tear the envelope apart uh, using the jets, and then perhaps if the coupling is strong enough, you could actually use that, if the angular momentum st coupling is strong enough, you could use that to bring them together. So jets are one avenue. There's other avenues that we could talk about, but jets are one avenue. So the first question is, do we accrete? Do we see accretion in this? And it's not easy to sort of figure this out because these flows are so complex, and you're very much driven by re you know, your resolution constraints, right? So you, you have to, you first of all, have to soften gravity around the, the point particles that form the core of the RGB star, or the, um, is that my, is that my timer? Okay. All right. So I'll, I only have a couple more slides. So um, let me just say. So so it's not easy to find uh, figure this out. This is a sim this is a, a view of the simulation. It's a cross cut through the line um, connecting the two uh, the two point particles, the core and the secondary. And what you see is you do get something that around. The, so this is the secondary, by the way. And the secondary does end up with this sort of cord apple shape. Those are not jets. We we first saw these we're like. Woo! getting jets, it's great, we don't even have magnetic fields. But this is actually a flow that channels, you know, it actually reverses sometimes. Sometimes it's flowing through the, uh, the sink particle and sometimes it's not. But the point I'm showing this to you is that for a while there, until they get really close, and I think the resolution, we're going down what the resolution can tell us, you do end up around the secondary, something that looks like a nice cord apple structure. And so here's actually the two models, no accretion and accretion. And with no, so, so let's just look at the accretion. With accretion, this is the interesting thing about the Krumholtz model. You know, Krumholtz model, subgrid model is very nice, works very well for star formation, but it's not clear that it works well for this kind of optically thick, very hot kind of medium. Because what the Krumholtz does is it basically looks around at the point particle and says, you know what, I'm going to remove everything around me, you know, mass, energy, pressure, um, you know, based on a Bondi uh, accretion scheme, right? I'm just going to look at what my densities are and my velocities, and I'll say, yeah, I'm just going to suck that out. So it literally, like, pulls um, uh, particularly pressure out of the center, and that's what allows these, you know, these flows to occur. Uh, so the question is like, wow, is all of this happening just because the subgrid model, right? And so the problem with subgrid models is exactly that. They're subgrid models. You don't really, you know, you're hoping that you got the physics right. Um, but though, I will note that, so this is cl a closer view. This is the secondary again. That's the secondary in the two cases. You can still, if you really uh, stare at these contours, you still, still do see a chord apple shape uh, here as well. But the difference between these two is, as I said, you're sucking material uh, out and pressure here. And here there's no place, material wants to accrete onto the star, onto the secondary, but there's no place for it to go. So you end up with sort of an extended atmosphere around it. And you can tell this by looking at the, these are plots, the blue lines 
are the mass inside spheres of different sizes, right? So we're just trying to get a handle around the secondary. So here's the secondary. We put a, uh, a, a small sphere around it, then a sphere that's twice as large, three times as large, and see how much mass is accumulating in it. And what you see is early on, you know, for all three of these, right? So this is the, the smaller the amount of mass is, the smaller the sphere. Um, but all of them, you see accretion happening. You're building up material until it sort of flattens out. It flattens out in all cases, which makes sense because there's no place for this material to go. Right? It just ends up being an atmosphere around the point particle. Whereas here is the case for the, um, uh, the Krumholtz subgrid model, and you see that you're increasing mass. You're, you know, your mass is falling onto the, the secondary the entire way through. And if you look at the, the accretion rates, you have a big spike here, but it still stays pretty large here. This is in units, that's 0.5 uh, solar masses per year. That's a tremendous amount of uh, mass falling onto the secondary. Right? And so um, depending on what the secondary is, you know, are we close to the, um, the Eddington limit? Okay, so just to close, this will be my last slide. So you know, this is what we're, we're doing, and we'll tell you hopefully in a year about you know, what we find. But in general, we have evidence that, yeah, this thing wants to accrete. Uh, now, is it a, an accretion, actually an accretion disk that's forming around it? That's uh, difficult to say. It sort of looks like it is. Um, but I do want to end up with, you know, for, uh, back in 94 for my PhD thesis, I ran what, I, what were state-of-the-art models to try and understand the shaping of planetary nebula. So what we did is we had a star, and there was a toroidal dis gas distribution, and we drove, a, we drove a spherical wind into this imaginary, you know, we just made up the toroidal distribution, and we got things that were, yeah, relatively bipolar, and we were very excited. But now what I want to show you, let's take the common envelope. Let's take what has been blown off of the common envelope, which is going to have a very toroidal distribution, and drive a wind into it. Because um, this is what we always want to do, have realistic initial conditions, drive a wind from the, the central star of the planetary nebula into that, and see what you get. And so if you can see here, you're driving these beautiful lobes coming out top and bottom. This is density, by the way. Um, you can also see, the, again, I love with the, seeing the AMR. The AMR is catching all the details there, but de de uh, resolving out. So lots of beautiful things about this. I mean, you get these beautiful bipolar lobes. We can let these grow out to you know, uh, observational size scales. Um, but the top and bottom look different, right? They're, they're, there's no symmetry, um, uh, top and bottom, because in this realistic simulation of a common envelope, it doesn't know that they should be top and bottom, should be symmetrical. So, you, you know, in real planetary nebula, in real YSO jets, in real uh, luminous blue variable nebula, we see, you know, amazing and very interesting differences between the two uh, bipolar lobes. And what I loved about this is it just sort of fell out of it. So um, we're, this is another issue area that we'll be pursuing. So that's where I am. Thank you very much. Planetary nebulae, the uh, gas is ionized enough that the magnetic, the external magnetic field becomes frozen in, in the gas. Uh, have you thought about the possible importance of an ionized medium, initially almost spherical, uh, propagating in the galactic magnetic field in which the magnetic pressure perpendicular to the field lines is greater than along the field line? And over 20,000, maybe 30,000 years, that differential pressure is the cause of the bipolar. You don't, you, in general, you don't get, people have done models of this actually early on with the first MHD code I built. We tried that. And it's, it's really hard to get, compared to the, the other forces you have on smaller scales, the inertial forces, and there's magnetic fields from the star itself. So those in general are going to overwhelm what you can do with the uh, ambient galactic magnetic field. You know, at best, with the ambient magnetic field, you get something that's slightly distorted, but trying to get like wasp wasted things or things is just very difficult to do. You need like magnetic fields that just don't make sense in terms of their strength. Okay, one last question, quick. So presumably you're creating that much outside <coughs> during the common envelope, you can actually form a disk and then actually start spinning it, spinning it up. Do you have any sort of estimates for like, so this was the progenitor of a sort of how much you might spin up the secondary? Um, no, that's an interesting, yeah, it's a, it's a good point. Obviously, you know, a, the angular momentum transfer here is going to be enormous, but yeah, some, that, that is a good point. That it would be worth. And we'll invite Adam again to give us more details on the After it's done, yeah. Let's thank Adam. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh-oh. There we go. All right. Uh, thank you. I'd like to tell you about some work that I've been doing over the past uh, like year and a half at this point. Um, looking into uh, zooming in even more, the magnetic fields of uh, planets around other stars eventually. Um, so this is a topic that we find to be interesting because um, I think we're coming to appreciate more and more that magnetic fields are very important for understanding, especially habitability of planets. Um, this is just an artist's conception from the uh, MAVEN mission, which I feel like is a little bit cheesy to show. Uh, but fundamentally, there is this idea that we have that Earth has a magnetic field. There's a big solar wind impinging on it. That drives all sorts of interactions. Um, and Mars does not. And one of the big takeaways of the MAVEN mission, which is, you know, like half a billion bucks, um, is that that lack of magnetic field really seems to have be directly related to Mars's lack of an atmosphere. And so if you care about things like habitability, um, understanding what kinds of planets have magnetic fields, what those magnetic fields are like, is going to be pretty important. Um, this is very hard to do for first principles, though. Uh, even within the solar system, uh, I'd say it um, it might be a little bit like with planet formation in general, where like we think we know what's going on, but the sample size is like five magnetized planets, and so uh, based on based on what we're seeing, it's really hard to know what what drives it all. Uh, the fluid dynamics, you know, it's turbulent magnetized convection. It's tough um, to learn about the magnetic fields of other planets. Uh, radio observations are the most promising thing that we have um, because all the, magnet, all the magnetized planets in the solar system give off very powerful radio bursts from a maser process, um, which is basically the only direct tracer of the magnetism that's bright enough that we could expect to see it in interstellar distances in the foreseeable future. Um, so we haven't detected any gen genuine planets yet, uh, but the ultra-cool dwarfs are in many ways what we've learned over the past, say, decade so, uh, is that they really just seem to be scaled up planets. I mean, brown dwarfs, you know, they're, they're more massive, their radii are about the similar, but it really seems more accurate to think of them as really big Jupiters rather than really small stars. And um, a lot of the work that I've done over the past few years, I think that it even holds true for things that genuinely are stars, things, you know, spectral types of M9 or whatever. Um, it seems they're very planet-like in a lot of ways. And so... Um, like planets, one thing that we've found is that radio is the best way to learn about their magnetism. And uh, I have a, a chapter in the Handbook of Exoplanets about this, if you want to learn more. Uh, so here's a plot from one of Ito's papers. Uh, so this is the radio light curve of one of our favorite brown dwarfy radio emitters. So this is just radio emission as a function of time over a span of about 10 hours, where you see these periodic radio pulses. And so this top panel is uh, total intensity. And this bottom panel is uh, Stokes V, so that's circular polarization. So the fact that these are basically opposites of each other is telling you this is intensely circularly polarized radio emission, which was exactly the uh, tracer of this maser process, which is one of the reasons that we uh, understand that we interpret these things in this planetary context. Um, phenomenologically, if you look at the planets within our own solar system, there's some very encouraging uh, similarities between what we see there and what we see in some of the ultra cool dwarfs. So in particular, uh, Jupiter gives off these radio bursts. It was the second discrete object to be detected in the radio in 1955. Um, its rotation, this is as a function of uh, which longitude is facing us, has a kind of high amplitude, double humped variability, which is something that we observe in some of the well-detected radio objects. Uh, it's got a very flat radio spectrum, uh, which is also something that we observe. And of course, nothing beyond the solar system are we, we're able to resolve spatially, but of course we can with Jupiter. And so this is a movie from the VLA of uh, what happens as Jupiter rotates, where remember its rotation period is around 10 hours or so, so it's spinning pretty quickly. And it has, um, the, the emission hat follows this structure, which I'll explain a little bit more. You can see there's sort of hot spots that wink in and out as it rotates, which is due to the asymmetries of the magnetic field and the nature of radio synchrotron emission, which I'll talk about more. Um, it also turns out that uh, if you want to apply this model to the case of the ultra-cool dwarfs, the underlying theory is actually really nice. Um, so the basic picture that we have is uh, Van Allen belts or radiation belts. So you have something with a largely dipolar magnetic field uh, that has trapped energetic particles. And so they bounce up and around, up and down in the field lines, and they're stuck there. Um, so on the Earth, you know, this is sort of the setup that we have. Of we have sort of inner and outer lo there's, uh, lobes. This area is called the slot, where 
magic makes the particles disappear. Um, and then uh, to actually understand the motion of these particles, it becomes this nice classical mechanics problem where spatially they're moving around very quickly. So they bounce up and down. That time scale is seconds. Uh, so that's latitudinal bouncing. And of course, these things are spiraling around a magnetic field. So they have this gyro motion that happens on microsecond time scales. And then over longer time scales, what they'll do is they'll drift longitudinally. So if you look at a statistical ensemble of particles, they'll basically, they have three invariants that correspond to these periodic motions. And for a fixed value, they sort of form some kind of shell, uh, with has, which has a certain height depending on the pitch angle of the particles at the, at the equator. And over time, uh, things diffuse in these three invariants uh, through two processes. There's a radial process and then an energy pitch angle process. Um, so they diffuse in parameter space, but given any set of parameters, you can map that to three-dimensional space and figure out what's going on. Uh, so I've been frustrated with the radio data that we have very nice data. The EVLA upgrade has been huge for this, uh, but our actual interpretation of the data has been lacking. So I've been trying to apply this model to the data that we have. Um, unfortunately, it turns out that you need uh, new models. Um, so one thing that we see in these radiation belts is that the synchrotron population is highly anisotropic. So um, this is like number of particles as a function of pitch angle. So this is basically most, like in Jupiter, you get the equatorial belt because most things are, have very high pitch angles are basically bouncing around the equator. Um, so this is actually a, uh, this is a real model that people use. It's just sine to the 60, which is the largest exponent I've ever used in a math. Um, so unfortunately, most synchrotron codes assume isotropic populations where you've just, you're just even across this. Um, so the calculations, the radio transfer coefficients that you need are very different than what people usually provide. So in generally, if you're doing this in full polarization, when we have lots of circular polarization, so we want to do that, you've got your four Stokes parameters. It's, you know, it's a simple equation, uh, but there's a lot of coefficients. It's true that um, you can transform it. Uh, you set the linear polarization basis, and there's symmetry here. So there's basically eight magic numbers that you need to calculate, uh, given some set of, you know, particle, how many particles have what pitch angles, what energies. Um, but there aren't any codes to do that, so I wrote a new one, or it derives very heavily from a code called Symphony that Charles Gammy's group is working on. Um, but I've added a lot. Uh, so first of all, I've added support for anisotropic distributions. Um, I've added these Faraday conversion terms, which are these, um, which I am aware, aware of very few work that ever does this before. Um, there's this 50 page paper with like 12 appendices by this guy who you know, lays out all the math very beautifully. Um, but now I actually do it, and then it's too slow, so you wrap it in a neural network approximator. So this plot is sort of um, harmonic number, which is kind of like one of your input parameters against one of your output parameters. Um, you normalize them to make it easier to work with, and so the orange dots are the, what you get from the full calculation, and the green dots are what you get from the neural network, and you can't see any orange dots because you get the same answer. Um, then I overlay it with um, Jason Dexter's GeoTrans, Geo Transfer Integrator. So if you want to do it with a, what if we want to do a black hole menu, uh, a brown dwarf menu sphere next to a black hole, you could. Um, and then I rewrote it in Rust because uh, some of the code is a little gross. Uh, so Rust is a great new thing. It's how you'd use it where you do C++. Um, you'll hear a lot more about it like in three years when everyone else catches up, which I'm going to make that claim because I was excited about Git back in 2005 when it came out. Um, and I'm more excited about Rust. It's great. Um, so indeed, uh, if you try and model emission with an isotropic population, uh, you don't get very good reproduction of the data. So here's uh, radio light curves of one of my favorite targets, in LTT 3370B. So you have this kind of double hump variation in total intensity. Uh, so this is 10 hours, this is 10 hours, this is a year later. And this is the um, Stokes circular polarization down here. So if I just like make a torus and make it homogeneous, and uh, spin it around where the parameters I've chosen here, in particular the inclination, uh, model what we believe about this system, which is extremely well characterized. Uh, the total intensity you know, doesn't vary much as it rotates. Um, if you choose one of these pancake distributions where the particles are pretty flat in pitch angle and the pitch angle distribution is really anisotropic, um, you get something that's much better. Or well, actually, you know, it's too good. It varies by you know, factors of, you know, it varies from 900 millijansky microjanskies to 200 microjanskies, and this is about the right. Uh, I just finally did the work where I converted to physical units. It was right. That was very encouraging. Um, and this is the Stokes v circular polarization image, and this is circular polarization fraction as it varies, which is also sort of in the right ballpark of tens of percent circular polarization. 
And this is at 5 gigahertz, but you can calculate it at whatever frequency you want. Um, so that's just using uh, distributions that are you know, uniform in a lot of parameters. The physically motivation, motivated way to do it is to solve this Fokker-Planck equation that governs the, the diffusion of particles in parameter space. Um, so I have a, a stochastic differential equation solver to do this. All right, that's, this is my penultimate slide, so that's good. Um, which is great, where basically you just take little pseudo particles and bounce them around in parameter space. And it's really dumb, but it is very parallelizable. And so you do it a, you know, a couple trillion times and you converge on a distribution. So here's just converging to the number of particles as a function of radial distance. Um, and I could talk more about that, but it's uh, much less broadly applicable, I think. Um, so overall, this Rymphony code uh, can, I think, I mean, I don't know of any other code that can do what it can do. And it does everything you want if you want Stokes, full Stokes. So that's pretty good. Um, so NLTT 3370B probably has a magneto disk. It probably has this like flat distribution of, of particles that are at low pitch angles that are distorting the magnetic field because it's rotating really quickly. Um, and you know, the, this variability in circular polarization is too high. This is too low. You add them together, I think that you'll get what we observe here, which I think especially because the way that this variation obviously changes over long time scales, whereas this one was pretty constant, hints at the existence of two populations. And finally, uh, there's a lot more to do. Like, so this is a 3D reconstruction of Jupiter's uh, radio emission. You notice there's a very sharp discontinuity that comes from the presence of some of its moons, which scatter the electrons as they're drifting inwards. Um, there's also claims that you cannot reproduce the radio spectrum of Jupiter without uh, including the effects of these moons. So even though we can't resolve other things spatially, we might be able to detect phenomena like this. Thank you. Right, or uh, technically, technically, one of the things we can detect are their planets. I always want to call them brown dwarf moons, but you know, the brown dwarf is the primary, so they'd be little brown dwarf planets. And one other thing that there was recently the Juno mission that went, uh, did that uh, give us much more insight as to the physics behind it? Oh, absolutely. Um, or it is, insight is happening. Uh, you know, uh, it, it's still collecting enormous amounts of data. There's all sorts of magnetometers and things. Lots of people are staying a long time. It, so we are learning more about the Jovian dynamo and then just the, the practical characterization of the detailed structure of its magnetic field and the energetic particle populations. Thanks. Peter, do you have a sense of how rapidly rotating um, an exoplanet uh, or a brown dwarf or whatever would need to be in order to, for these anisotropic effects to become important? Um, I, I believe not very rapidly. I mean, some of the... One of the popular theories of the underlying dynamo is that it's actually uh, uh, agnostic as to rotation rate. So the, you don't, in terms of the magnetic field strength, you might be able to get fields that are just as important. And then you know, what's, really setting, what's really setting that anisotropy um, is how the particles are diffusing in, in the magnetosphere, which is due to the interactions of you know, those, the pitch angle energy coefficients that you get from the particles interacting with the waves and the field, with the magnetic field waves. So that's really not, I don't think that's bound to the rotation period at all. So it's more important for the light curve rather than just the radio power. Because like, the radio power scales with the rotation of the planet and the mass of the planet. Those sort of quantities. Uh, at least in the solar system. Yeah, I mean, like, you're, you know, for the solar system, it's all convolved with the fact that things are being impinged upon by the solar wind, and there's a correlation there, and and the radio output definitely goes up and down with the solar wind. Um, these are clearly, you know, these are free-floating, and yet they still have radio emission. So that is not necessary. But anyway, so um, I don't think the radio power is necessarily going to go up and down with the rotation period in any well-defined way for things that are free-floating. Uh, our time limit. Let's thank uh, Peter and the rest. <laughs>